My task is uh, uh, church conflict through the lens of James. And uh, I am... I was joking with uh, the other guys before the presentation. They were talking about slides and stuff. And I have a lot of slides, but all of my slides are basically that particular verse in James I want us to look at. Because I knew I would be doing this while you guys are eating. The advantage for me speaking while you're eating is that you won't fall asleep uh, while I'm talking unless you, t- unless you habitually fall asleep at home at the, uh, at the dinner table. Uh, I've been working on a larger project on the book of James and... Uh, uh, rather, a larger project on conflict. And let me make sure my clicker's clicking. It is. Um, and I had flagged a few obvious verses in James. And obviously, you've already seen there's some low-hanging fruit, uh, biblically, that's easy to find, easy to pick about conflict in the book of James. And um, so I thought it might be good. Just Let's just run through it and talk about all of the verses that are in there. And then I, I got into it when I looked at the verses that directly deal with conflict and the verses that apply, in my mind, to conflict or the resolution of conflict in some way, I thought maybe I have too much material. And so I'm going to be moving along at a pretty good pace. Uh, But at the end of that, if you want to hang around and uh, visit with me a little bit about something that's going on, then uh, I would be happy to stay here and visit with you. Now, James is one of the earliest books, we think, maybe the first book written in the New Testament. So maybe about 43 A.D.-ish. And if you're wondering where I get that date, you can go and watch the background video on the YouTube channel. It's an estimation. It's kind of one of our best guesses. But it's, just, it's surprising to me as I was reading through James and just thinking about Acts chapter 2. Because it, when Acts chapter 2, I mean, the church is just so harmonious. That, I mean, just everything is, there's no conflict there. And everything is just, everybody's on the same page in unity. And, and we're thinking, yeah, that's exactly what the church should be like. And then maybe potentially a decade later, maybe from roughly 33 to 43, 10 or 12 years in there, we have the book of James, and there's just so much, in my estimation, about conflict in the church in the book of James that's kind of developed over this 10-year period. I was really kind of amazed when I uh, I sat back to to think about that. Now, James opens his letter, and I'm going to just say letter because there's some... There's some debate about what kind of literature James is, because I do think it was designed to circulate. I think it's obvious he wanted this to go out to multiple churches so that they could take advantage of uh, what he had to say. And when you when you go back and you look at the book of Acts, it's easy to see that the church in Jerusalem is the mother church. Okay, They're the church that sets the standard. They're the church that sets the pace. And all of these new churches including the churches that uh, Paul is ultimately going to plant, look back to Jerusalem uh, as, um, as that standard. But he starts in verse 2, in a verse that we've already read and, and jumped in. Uh, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you are mature and complete. And let me just say that nothing tests our faith like conflict among a group of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, who love each other more than they love themselves, who are looking out for the interests of the other people in the church more than they're looking out for their own interests, and um, you know who are ready, obviously ready, to lay their lives down for these same people. You know, just ordinary church conflict. <laughs> Uh, none of us in this room are surprised by the presence of conflict, although I think some people who, who were alive when James wrote this, who, but who were, had been alive in Acts chapter 2, I think maybe they were surprised about this conflict that came in. Um, and uh, we all have a story or two at the ready. We don't have time uh, really to share those. Uh, given the schedule that we have today, but you know, we were talking about counseling. One of the, one of the things in my role uh, is 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 therapy. I don't do counseling, but I do therapy uh, because I listen to pastors come in and share about what's going on in their church that is is making their hair turn gray or making their hair fall out. Or and I see it's happened to some of you guys already. Um, uh, but it, it's it's hurting their soul. It's causing them angst and anguish in their soul. And the therapy side of what I do is just listening to to their stories uh, because sometimes there's not any real resolution to that. 
Uh, and James goes on to point out here that this testing of our faith, and I would say especially the testing of conflict, right, when it comes to the testing of our faith, it produces endurance and that we need to let endurance have its full effect. Now, the Greek word there is, is to lie on, right? And uh, the only reason that, uh, that I, I share that with you is that the same exact word is used in the next phrase. Uh, you need to let endurance be to lie on so that you may be to lie on. We need to let endurance, he says, have its full effect. Endurance needs to, in other words, reach maturity in our lives so that we can reach maturity in Christ. And that's kind of the point or the pressure point he was putting there. And um, so what does it mean? What does it mean when we're talking about endurance having its full effect when we're thinking about conflict in church? Now, we certainly endure by staying engaged, right, in that conflict in a godly manner. All right? We're going we're gonna to focus on that conflict. And, and James says we're not going to reach maturity if endurance is short-circuited. Now, the initial default in dealing with conflict at church is what? It's denial. Let's just ignore it. Let's hope it goes away. Let's, let's not talk about the, the problem that's sitting in there. Let's not talk about the, the elephant that's in the room, and maybe it'll go away. And, and the idea is, is that we're not going to talk about this. We're not going to deal with this. We're not going to confront any of this behavior in the church because then we won't have peace at church. And we're really hoping to have peace at church. I, I feel like a lot of, from what I've seen, a lot of people's default is to leave the church and go find another one. And then that's, and, and that's in this, you're, you're jumping right into my next point, brother. I think you're exactly right. We're not enduring, guys, if we bail. And, and, and go to another church. And, and this is true for as, as much for the pastors in these situations as it is for the church members in these situations. And, and, and I, were, I was having a conversation over here. There is a point at which it is not a good match. It was a bad hire between the church and the pastor. And in those situations, I think that there is probably needs to be a healthy spiritual parting, okay, and, uh, and, and, and go on. And, and if, um, one of the reasons we do premarital counseling is, is, is for the simple fact of making sure we have two people that, whose lives are going in the same direction. Because if you have somebody who, as a believer, feels like God has called them to foreign missions and, you, and they marry somebody who absolutely is convinced that God has not called them to foreign missions, what's up with that? Right? That's a bad marriage relationship. Um, and God has called us to different things. And, and so there are times when uh, the, a, a healthy, spiritual, uh, godly parting needs to take place. But I think a lot of times we jump the gun on that, either as church members or as pastors, and we decide, you know what, I'm just going to go to another church. I, 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 don't, I don't have to deal with this. As what, what, is it, what does my usually say? I, I don't have to take this here. I can, I can go home and be treated like this, right? <laughs> Um, now my wife, my wife loves me and she treats me well because this is being recorded. My wife is a good wife. My kids are lovely. Um, but ultimately, it says that God, that means that God can use. If endurance is so important in our spiritual maturity, it means that God can use conflict in a positive way if we allow Him to. If we are walking in the Spirit the way that God intends us to walk. And we're not enduring anything, guys, when we respond in kind or if we retaliate in anger. We aren't enduring if we bail, as we said a while ago. Uh, in Hebrews 12, I read across this, this verse, and this is kind of a, someone at our church shared this in a kind of a prayer time, scripture-led prayer time. It says, For consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Don't just don't go weary and give up. Uh, now keep moving to keep us with our time. James goes on in verse 12 in chapter one. He says, "Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him." Now notice James carries this idea of enduring testing a little bit further. The one who endures is not just going to mature. This person is going to receive the crown of life, the crown of life for those who love God. 
Now, this endurance that James, James is talking about, and this is where I'm going to go with this, guys. It's not, it's, this is not super spiritual. This is kind of very practical. The endurance that we're supposed to have there is based on the fact, it's based on our love for God and our love for the people that we are in conflict with. Now, you've already, I've been listening this morning. You've already heard those words this morning, and I can't remember which, which person shared those, but we, we've got to walk in love for them. And um, guys, successful conflict resolution is not peace. Successful conflict resolution is not peace. Successful conflict resolution is unity. That's actually our goal. And the problem that we go so messed up in church today is our goal is in the wrong place. We're shooting for peace when what we ought to be shooting for is unity. Uh, and I think we often deny the reality of conflict or even the need to confront in the name of peace because we say we're working for peace in our midst. And guys, uh, denial uh, is not even peace. Denial is just the hope for peace. We want peace. We hope for peace. And so we're going to ignore some of the things that are going on. Now, James moves on into verse 13, the very next verse. He says, no one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he's drawn away and he's enticed by his own evil desire. So how does God use conflict? Let's come back to us as pastors again. How does God use conflict to mature us? Because conflict reveals the unholy desires that we have inside of us. And uh, the, the things that are in our heart, power and popularity and pride and prejudice and greed and arrogance and self-love and the conflict, guys, that we're experiencing, uh, we think we have all of these things under control. We think we've addressed them in our life, but, they, but they're still there. And conflict pulls back the skin a little bit, right? And, and we, in conflict, we not only suffer the pain of the skin getting pulled back on us, but we start to bleed things that make us uncomfortable. Um, uh, when I respond back to somebody with a hurtful or a cutting remark or, or a quick comeback, I can't blame that on the other person. That came out of me. That was me. And in verse 18, let me just kind of keep moving along here. It says, by his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be kind of a first fruits of his Christian, uh, of his creatures. Who are we in Christ, guys? It's not who we were in Adam. It's not who we were in Adam. We are to reflect Christ. And, one, and, and again, this has already been mentioned today. I'm going to say it again. One of the primary roles of leadership, guys, in the church is to model the kind of behavior uh, that we see in Christ. I mean, think about that list of, of characteristics in 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's 10 there that qualify one for the office of bishop or, or uh, elder there, depending on how, how, what, how you want to name that passage in there. But two of those 10, two of those 10 deal directly with conflict. It says we can't be a bully and we can't be quarrelsome. That's, that's at the top of the baseline qualification for what we're called to do in the ministry as pastors. We can't be a bully, even if they call it a bully pulpit, right? We can't be a bully, and we can't be quarrelsome. We have to model biblical theology, guys, because no one is going to believe your theology, no matter how good it is, no matter how excellent your Bible study teachings are, no matter how great of a preacher you are, you aren't going to have any credibility in the pulpit if your behavior doesn't match what you're preaching. Because poor behavior trumps good theology every single day of the week. Verse 19, James just keeps on rolling through here. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Now, I don't have to do any exegesis here. One, because we've already talked through this passage, right? Uh, but it, it's just obvious how this applies to conflict. This is, this is, this is what we want to model as pastors, this is where we want to be. We've got to be setting the stage for this. And even though it, it, it feels right sometimes to put somebody in their place at church, guys, it, it, it feels righteous, but it never ends righteously. 
It never ends righteously. And it doesn't matter how true it is what you say about them or to them or how many people in the room know it's true when you say it. It still doesn't end righteously. And it can't be played off as speaking the truth in love because speaking the truth in love is something that you do in a one-on-one conversation, right? It's not public humiliation. And that quick quip, it never comes across as, as something that Christ himself would have said or would have done, even though he made a whip out of rope and drove the animals out and overturned the the tables in the temple in his righteous indignation, and even though he referred to the Pharisees as a group of snakes, right, vipers, it just doesn't come across that way for us. So here's a truth that you can count on. And and I, I, had, I don't have any handouts, and I, I, I didn't provide anything for you to, to do notes on. I was teasing with some of these guys beforehand. They had all of the fancy stuff, but my I was going to use a wooden stick with a, a, a picture of a, 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 a black and white picture of a chalkboard from the 1950s with something written on it. I was going to point to it, right? Um, but here's something you can count on. You should probably write this down. There, is, oh, there are always going to be those in the church who are trying to stay neutral in whatever conflict it is. They're going to say, I'm not going to take sides. I don't believe in conflict. I don't think this is healthy. I don't think this is Christian. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be at odds with each other. We should be in unity. Uh, there are always going to be those who are, who are not taking sides in that conflict, but the very moment that you put somebody in their place as a pastor in the midst of that conflict, they are going to have compassion on that person, whether they are right or wrong or indifferent, and they are and they are going to see you, they're going to perceive you to be somebody who is lacking in compassion, and suddenly you have somebody who is not taking sides in a conflict for their conscience sake in Christ, who are now taking a side against you, because you were the one, you have become the bad guys in their eyes, all right? And you need to remember that, because I'm just preaching the truth in love here for you. But let's keep moving. Verse 26, the last thing he says in, in uh, <coughs> did I skip 26? I did skip 26, all right. I, was, I had edited myself down a little shorter. Let's go to chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 8. Again, we just jumped in this passage. Uh, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin, and you are convicted by the law as transgressors. Forever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it at all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. You know something we don't do very well in church during a conflict? That's love our neighbor as ourself. But you know something we're excellent at when it comes to conflict in church? That's quoting a verse of scripture we think supports our side of the equation. And oftentimes in conflict at church, you have these people that are quoting these scriptures and these people that are quoting these scriptures. And what does James say? James says you need to remember that the same God who put this in scripture also put this in scripture and let me just say to you guys as pastors you're quote unquote the biblical ex- experts the resident experts on the bible in your churches uh, or hopefully you are the resident expert of the bible in your church i've, I've known some old, old saints in church some little old ladies point taken who i thought well, they, they, they may actually know more about the bible than i do <laughs> but you are you are considered to be the resident expert on scripture in there and and guys we we have to remember that that we have to look at both sides of scripture if if someone comes to me and quotes a scripture to me i need to always seriously take uh, take that scripture seriously every single time that is god's word and 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 in in the same way that the the same the same god who inspired um uh i think it's matthew to uh, uh, write about Jesus in the temple with a whip in his righteous indignation. Also, it's the same God who inspired James to say that we needed to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. Because you, And you know why we need both of those exhortations? Because we are not a people in our sinful natures who have balance at all times in our life. And when somebody else quotes scripture to us, rather than write them off, And maybe they quoted that out of context. I don't know. But I think we should look at it and weigh it out. 
And I think it's particularly important if you are the resident scriptural expert uh, in your church that you don't ever, ever quote a scripture out of context. Because hopefully when you do it, you know it. Um, And we should never get that. And guys, we should never try to get people to be on our side. Because let me, let me just say a few words about that and, and favoritism. Every time that we, we draw lines and we're trying to convince people to join our side in that, we are cultivating a version of favoritism. Okay, because what is favoritism? What is the problem in when James is talking about favoritism in chapter 2? It's the motivation behind preferring those rich people, right? And... and, and What is my motivation in creating this other group of people who are supporting me over against people who are supporting that other group? It's it's my motivation in that issue. And so we were just when we trying to get groups to take side in church, we're just cultivating a version of favoritism. Guys, we're setting the stage where we're going to prefer some people in the church over other people in the church in this particular sense, because it's a conflict that's going on now. I promised you a dead run. I'm going to stay at a dead run. Chapter 3, well, that's the rest of that verse. We talked about it. Um, Chapter 3 talks about the tongue. And um, he says, And consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, although the tongue is small, a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how great a a small fire, consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest. Now, what I want to point out to you guys is that little phrase there, wherever the will of the pilot directs. Now, obviously, the rudder is the tongue. The ship is a big thing. James's point there is that the little tongue is driving the big ship. But notice what he also says in there, he, that that rudder is turning at the will of the pilot. Guys, those, those little things that we say, we choose to use our tongue improperly. We choose to, and it, and it can be very subtle things where we're, we're talking about, when maybe we just, we insinuate that this person really doesn't know as much about the Bible as they think they know about the Bible. We, we, we kind of lay some background. Maybe we gently bring up that, well, you remember that time 20 years ago when they, you know, they caused this ruckus in the church and it didn't have anything to do with this ruckus. But we're just, we're just reminding people. We're just, we're just saying some things out there. We're choosing to, to put some things in the conversation to help steer the ship, we think, in the direction that, as pastors, that we think the ship ought to go. But the danger of that is what? It's the danger that James points out here is that once once we once that fire gets out, guys, we don't have any control over it. We have no control. You can say something about a person, and maybe it's even true, but once you say it, once it comes out of your mouth and it gets out there in that, that in that fresh dry grass, you have absolutely no control over where that's going to go. It doesn't take a lot of gossip to drive a church conflict into a bad direction. Look what he says in verse 9. It says, and this is the problem. With the tongue we we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. And blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things uh, should not be this way. Does a, a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives? My brothers and sisters are a grapevine produce figs. Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. And this is the biblical issue, guys. We end up praising God with the same mouth, with the same tongue that we curse those who are made in his image. Now, we, we relegate the idea of cursing to foul language in our culture. But that's not what James is talking about. He's talking about talking bad about someone, right? Uh, And James is not exaggerating the power of the tongue at all. There's no, this is not hyperbole. This is not like, you know, a camel going through the eye of needle illustration where Jesus is intentionally exaggerating to make a point. There's no exaggeration in this text when James is talking about it. How many churches, guys, have been set ablaze 
because somebody, church member or pastor, abused the power of the tongue to try to get their way at church. There's not a great difference between gossip and character assassination. And there's probably no difference between character assassination and cursing someone. And James implies here, guys, now you may disagree with this. This is an interpretation on my part, and you may disagree with my interpretation, and, and I'll, re, I'll still respect you, but James implies here that it's not possible to be a genuine believer and curse someone because the spring can't produce fresh water and salt water from the same source. We can't try to destroy somebody else's life uh, and, and, and genuinely be a believer, genuinely be a follower of Christ. Now, we often justify what we say. Well, you know, I needed to say that. I needed to put that information in there. But, but guys, I think we have to step back and, and be very careful when it comes to the tongue. Um, and that's where James gets into this chapter. I think that's why he talks about wisdom. And I skipped all the the demonic stuff, but let's just look at verse 17. It says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, and then peace-loving, and gentle, and compliant, and full of mercy, and good fruits, and unwavering, without pretense. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. And, And as we said while ago... And it was David, I think, who was talking about this, that you know, we're either speaking in the wisdom that comes from above. Maybe that was you, Chad, right? Is it, is it worldly, worldly wisdom, worldly counsel versus, versus biblical counsel, right? We're either speaking in the wisdom that comes from above or we're depending on worldly wisdom, which really worldly wisdom tells us to, to destroy those who disagree with us. I mean, think about our culture Cultural, think about politics, guys. This is an election year. We're going to see a lot of this. Worldly wisdom says destroy their credibility, not their argument. Don't worry about the logic of their thinking. Don't worry about the facts. Just destroy their credibility. That's worldly wisdom. And But speech that flows from God's wisdom is going to be what? It's going to be pure and peace-loving and gentle and compliant and full of mercy and full of good fruit, unwavering and without pretense. And then there's this pivotal point he makes here that the fruit of righteousness is going to be sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. So if you ask yourself, is this wisdom come from God? Is this counsel come from God or not? There is a measuring stick built in there that goes along with this, that, that it, it's, it's going to be something that's sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. And guys, this is why our anger can't produce the righteousness of God. And it's not just our speech, guys, that's going to be characterized by these things, but our actions as well. Now, it, it struck me when I was looking at this verse that two of, the, two of these, can't, these characteristics that he gives in, in uh, verse 17, uh, they, they stand out to me as potentially being the opposite of each other. Um, compliant and unwavering. Compliant and unwavering. Now, to be compliant means it's the idea that you're you're going to listen to a reasonable argument. You're going to listen to what the other person has to say. You're going to consider what it is that they have to say. That's kind of the idea behind the word compliant in there. Unwavering is the idea that that you know you. You, you have a, a lack of doubt about what it is that you believe. And, and both of these two particular words are only used here in the New Testament, just in James, in this one spot. And when we think about conflict, it, 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 words like peace-loving and gentle and full of mercy, I, these have easy application to us. But I think compliant and unwavering represent the tension that we feel in church about what we should be doing over particular issues. Compliant and unwavering. How can we be open-minded and firm in our beliefs at the same time? And and, uh, why is that tension even in Scripture at all? And I think the answer to that, guys, is that because we are sinners, every one of us 
who are saved by grace, which means we, we, we not only that, that our understanding is imperfect, guys, but also our practice of the truth is imperfect as well. And, and this means that we have to listen to others carefully. We have to actually listen. We talked about active listening in here. It, that's just not something that we need to do in counseling. Guys, we need to do active listening in conflict when we're one of those parties in that conflict and we're not the third neutral party. And, and it is arrogant. It is arrogant, pastor or not, to believe that we are always right. Because we're not. And where do we find righteousness in conflict at church? Uh, it's in the wisdom of God. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. James moves into chapter 4 by talking about conflict. Guys, and this is the low-hanging fruit I was talking about a little earlier. Uh, wars and fights among you. I'm not going to read this passage to you. Um, uh, we, we've talked about it already, but let me say a few things about it. It's up here on the screen. You can kind of glance at it. James has acknowledged the conflict present in the church. And, and uh, really, it's not, it's not surprising as you read the book of Acts, because we see beginning in Acts chapter 6, or, well, in Acts chapter 5, you know, Ananias and Sapphira. There's, a, there's the, the fruits of conflict are starting in chapter 5 already. But in chapter 6, you have the, this, this conflict between the, the traditional Jewish Christians and the Hellenistic Jewish Christians, and somebody in there, bless his heart, whatever, whoever he was, for whatever his reasoning was, who was in charge of this food ministry, decided it would be a good idea not to feed, give food to the uh, Hellenistic Jewish widows, the Greek-speaking Jewish widows, and it causes this conflict in there. And this tension that we see in there in Acts chapter 6, it just kind of starts to grow there in the early church until we get to like Acts chapter 15, and you have the circumcision party, uh, which, is, which is convinced, absolutely convinced, that, the, that everybody, all of the Gentiles who come into the church have to be circumcised and follow the law before they can be a believer of Christ. And keep in mind, guys, this seemed to them to be both biblical and wise. But it wasn't. Notice that James, in this passage, the one we have on the screen here, he pinpoints the source of conflict, and it's our own personal sinful desires. And think back, just think about a conflict in your head, a recent conflict in your church, and just think about how personal sinful desires drove and played a role in that particular conflict. Um, these sinful desires, James say, even affect our prayer life. Because we end up praying for things without pure motives, and we end up asking God for things that are designed to serve us right. instead of serving him. So every time we argue over the style of preaching or music or what time we have Sunday school or Bible study or the order of worship... Aren't our desires in these things just the things that make us happy? I mean, if you think about it, isn't it, aren't we just arguing for the things that make us happy? And when we're unhappy, what do we often do? <coughs> Verse 11, he says, don't criticize one another, brothers and sisters. Anyone who defames, circle that word mentally in, your, in the Bible page in your head, Anyone who defames or judges a fellow believer defames and judges the law. If you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one law giver and judge who's able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So what's the real difference between criticizing somebody and speaking the truth in love to them? You ever thought about that? It's the wisdom from above that's... Peaceful and gentle and pure and compliant and full of mercy. And the, and the question you need to ask yourself when you need to confront somebody, and let me just say, if you're a pastor in a church and you don't confront people, you're probably not doing your job. But how you confront people when there's a problem in the church is of the utmost importance. So can the person you're addressing see and feel the love that you have for them as you have this conversation with them. <clears throat> While you're sharing something that's difficult for them to hear. Because what does it really mean to defame another believer? I don't use that word. I had to look it up. Let me just confess that to you, all right? 
confess your sins to one another. I had to look that word up in the dictionary. It means to damage their good reputation. Now, that can be more than just slandering them. Um, It can be questioning their motivation. Guys, uh, and if I question your motivation, aren't I just attacking your character? Is your your motivation impure in that? Why, Why are you asking that question? Why, why are you doing that? Why are, why are you causing an issue here? Are you, are you just trying to, to, to get something else sidetracked? Because, guys, how can we even know somebody else's motivation? I can't look into your heart and know what your motivation is. Uh, and I can't be, James says, we can't be the judge, especially we can't be the judge in a conflict where we're one of the parties that is involved. And I know if you go back into Corinthians, James says don't go and take each other to the court, but get some other believers and let them make a judgment for you. That's real. But if you're in the conflict, you can't be one of those judges. And he jumps down into verse 17. He says, so it's a sin to know the good and yet not do it. Man, isn't that, isn't that just Christianity? Isn't that the church today? We have all these things that we know about the Bible. Our problem is not that we don't know enough about the Bible, guys. Our problem is that we don't live out what we know about the Bible. That's our problem. And when we know that we should not gossip and not criticize and not judge and not defame someone's reputation or their character, and we still do these things, God pays attention God pays attention to that. It's sin. Let me just say a few things about chapter 5. He said, Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Not only are we commanded to avoid criticizing one another, we are to avoid complaining about one another. And I'm not smart enough to tell you the difference between criticizing somebody and complaining about them. Maybe one is to their face and one is not to their face, perhaps. But this one comes with a warning about judgment. And then in verse 12, he says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no mean no so that you won't fall under judgment. Guys, one of the things that's killing us in church right now is a lack of honest communication. We don't, we don't talk about the, uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, if somebody does come to us with a problem, maybe we listen to them, maybe we nod, or maybe we say we agree with them, whether we agree with them or not. Um, uh, sometimes we're, we're working on something as a pastor in a church, and we're polling our folks and say, hey, you know, maybe we're thinking about uh, uh, getting elders, installing elders in a church and moving in that direction. What do you think about that? And the, and the person says, yeah, I think that would be a great idea. And you talk to three or four key leaders, and they all seem to be on board with that. And then you get to the meeting where you're going to talk about it to the church, and then all of a sudden, lo and behold, they're not in favor of it at all. Because they're yay has not been yay, and their nay has not been nay. There's not an honest... They didn't feel like they could be honest with you for some particular reason and tell you that they didn't think that that was a great idea. But guys, if we can't... Let me just say this. Dishonesty always leads to disunity. (coughs) Dishonesty always leads to disunity in the church. And if we can't be honest at church with what we believe, where are we going to be honest? Is that going to happen on Facebook or on Instagram, or on the social media formerly known as Twitter? No. It's not. One last verse, and then I'm going to let you guys stop enduring me. It says, My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you strays from the truth, and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. There's really two more issues that, that I think touch conflict on the church in this in this verse. And the first is accountability in the body of Christ. And the second is church discipline. Now, James clearly advocates accountability at church. I mean, he's talking about confessing your sins to one another, right? Um, real accountability, guys, at some point 
is going to lead to church discipline for somebody who is unwilling to repent. I want you to think about that for a second because we don't do much with church discipline anymore. And I'll talk to you in a second why that is. But let me just say this. Accountability is the only path to unity in the church. We have to be accountable to each other or we're never going to achieve unity within the body of Christ. And accountability, guys, is also the authority to address conflict in a godly way. Because we are accountable to each other, that gives us the authority to address each other when something is going wrong. And in verse 19, it's a reference to successful accountability, right? Someone was turned away from their error. But guys, the ending that we hope for doesn't always happen. The person that we confront doesn't always repent uh, uh, in that. And then when that happens, the church either has to ignore that problem and it becomes an elephant in the room or they have to do church discipline. I was talking to, uh, well, he's the... He's the president of Guidestone now, Hans Stilbeck. He and I went to college together. And I saw him about, I don't know, 15 years ago, and we were just talking about church life. And he said, yeah, I'm a pastor up in, I'm not going to tell you where. Um, and it was, uh, he kind of moved up to a little bit larger church. And he said, I, I got there and, and I realized that um, um, there was a, one of my deacons uh, has a, uh, a mistress that he keeps in a house there in town and has done this for a number of years. And, and not only does, does, does everybody in the church know that he has this mistress, but he says the whole town knows that he has this mistress. And this has been going on for, I don't know, 10, he, when he got there, 10 or 15 years, 20 years, I don't know. He's just always had this mistress, this lady he kept in this house up there on the hill. And the church has done nothing about it. It was this white elephant in the room that they didn't talk about it. The only thing he said you could do, he said you could go back to the, look through all of the records uh, about all of the committees. And he was active, 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 active serving. And then there was a point in the line, you could draw a line there. And they, the church took him off of every committee and relieved him of every responsibility physically at the church, but that was the only thing that they did in this situation. He looked at me and he said, oh my gosh. He said, one of these days, this guy's old now, he's in his 80s. He says, I'm gonna, he's going to die and I'm going to be responsible for doing his funeral. He said, what am I going to say at this man's funeral? And all of that tension fell upon him as pastor because the church was unwilling to do church discipline. Now, why don't we do church discipline? Because we did it so stupidly for so many years. Right. Nobody wants to do church discipline if we do it stupidly. When I first got to Joy in 1995, Joy Baptist Church, it was, a, it was one of our anniversary mark years, 110 years, I think, as a church, and they had a celebration, and they pulled out all the old minutes, and they started reading the minutes in the... In the, in the from, from the old times, and they, and they highlighted, and they read the story of this guy, and in the minutes of the business meeting, it says, yeah, so-and-so heard so-and-so cuss this week out uh, in the community, so we churched him. <laughs> I, I he was out. You're absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't speaking ministerially. Um, guys, nobody wants to do church discipline if we do it stupidly. Um, and we just we just need to we need to deal with con conflict is going to happen, <clears throat> but we need to deal with conflict in a way that um, uh, that glorifies God. And that doesn't mean everybody's going to walk away happy, but it does maintain the reputation of both God and the church <coughs> in the community if we do it right. Uh, I was amazed at how much of the book of James either directly or indirectly addressed conflict. And you guys got the brunt of that. I'm sorry. You had the whole brain dump here in these few minutes. Uh, but when you look at 1 Corinthians, it's full of conflict. And even the books where Paul is excited about what's going on, like Romans and Philippians, they have a section addressing church conflict. 
Uh, sin brings conflict, guys, and we're all sinners saved by grace. But so much of what the New Testament has to say about conflict is summed up in James in a lot of different ways. So, um, questions? Anybody have any questions about some of my weird biblical interpretations? You're just ready. You're just ready. You're so you said, you said uh, <clears throat> well, uh, two, two things, I guess. How would you, um, you know, as far as church discipline is concerned, I mean, I've, I've read a lot about it and, and you know, thought about it. Um, I agree with you that we don't have much of a stomach for it. As, I mean, I even don't, you know, it wouldn't be my desire. I saw a guy asking on a Facebook forum this week that he had a, a, person, a man that struggled with, with anxiety who wasn't coming to church. And he said, what should I do? And there were all these people telling him that they should they should uh, disfellowship him. And I said, I, I don't think I would make that the test case. But don't you think that if you had a guy that had, had a mistress for 15 years, I mean, I mean, the answer to that would be you've got to do something where he might, lest he think he's going to heaven when he dies. Well, you know, I mean, that, that's... Yeah, I, I I think it put it put the the pastor who comes in on the back end of it in a hard position, right? Yeah. The church really should have done something more than take him off committees at the church when it became public knowledge. And I can't imagine how in their minds they thought that it cleared them with the community at large who knew this deacon at their church what was in there. Um, and, and so you're asking me what would I do, have done if I came in as the, like, the, the pastor late? Probably some point where you, yeah, where you just have to say, hey, we just can't do this. No, I, I would probably have a conversation with the, the deacon body as to why he was not removed as a deacon. And I would start with discipline at that level yeah, yeah. Uh, because I, don't, I, I think in the very least I could not tolerate him with the title deacon at the church. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I'm all for people who are um, immersed in sin coming to church on Sundays. I think they need to come to church. It's an opportunity to hear God's word. It's an opportunity for them to repent. Um, but, I, but I don't think that they, you give them any title or any reflection of leadership at the church in any way. And so I, I, would, I would personally probably start right at the deacon, the deacon level. And then once those conversations get started, uh, sometimes the, the, the church might be willing to say, yeah, we, we've just never had a pastor who is willing to take any action here, but we are. Yeah. And then at that point, maybe at some point, it's your job as a pastor to put the brakes. If, if, if like it gets down to where we're going to take him out and pour tar over him and light him on fire you know, and drag his body to the edge of the city limits, yeah. you might have to put the brakes on that because again you don't want church discipline to get stupid that's why we stopped doing it and for all practical reasons because they had not done it in a re restorative way yes never the goal is always to restore yeah. that person like it is in first corinthians chapter five the goal is always to restore that person back yeah. to fellowship that goes that goes back to the pastor having a conversation with the person not necessarily the <clears throat> well i think after first. after he's had a mistress for 20 years and the entire community knows about it, I, I would probably start that conversation with the deacon body because I would want to know why they haven't taken any action, why there has been no, why they're letting this to just yeah. to go. Or, or what's been said to them in the past. I mean, because you, you don't know, you, there's so much of the history you don't, you're, you aren't there for. Yeah, so you, you've got to catch up to speed. <clears throat> yeah. And so that's going to start with a conversation with your leadership. Um, and then if he's, but it, it, and, and this is this is where I, I don't have a good answer to this question because, but I think we need to talk about it. So let's just throw this out for a second. If I go and I have a conversation with the leadership of the church, uh, which in in this case was a traditional Southern Baptist church where your deacons are basically functioning as elders, right? And and say to them, why why has this gone on for this period of time? Uh, I need to know. The, but if they say because nobody, no pastor was willing to take action, then I have to make a decision. What is the proper action after this has been sitting here? Do I come in as a self-righteous, you know, young preacher and say, all right, nope, we got to put down the law. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna. Does that fix the church's reputation in the community? 
So I, I think there needs to be some prayerful, I don't know the exact answer to the question you're asking me, but I, I think we've got to weigh out what is what is the Lord moving us to do here in terms of upholding the standard of morality and righteousness. Which I think you would just work, I mean, you would just work Matthew 18. Yeah. Go to him, take another way. I mean, you just, I think you just, you know, Okay. Good. And so let me play the devil's advocate here because that's what I'm really good at, right? All of this biblical stuff, uh, you know, I'm so-so with. But the devil's advocate I'm great at. So you have this woman who has been taken care of by this man who's not her husband for 20 years. He's kept her in this house. Um, And if I go to him and say, well, you really need to repent before you die so that I can say something good at your funeral. And he does that and he cuts her off. What do I do for that woman now? who is probably also advanced in age at this time and needs somebody to care for her. And so I, I think I have a responsibility to reach out there as well. And so it, it's, 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 it's not a... It's a similar thing whenever they go into a... a, when a, when a polygamist comes to Christ in yeah. whatever culture they're in, and they say, hey, you, you're going to have to... You can only have one wife, but you, you've made commitments to take care of these other ones. So you, you know, it might look weird... But, but you still like, need to take care of them. Repentance, you know, rep- yeah, repentance in that situation might be strange. And, and But the fear, I think, would be if this guy has been able to live in a habitual sin for that long, it's probably definitely an indication that he's not saved. I mean, I don't see how you could... Or, or, or his, his, his heart is, is... Maybe he stayed in that condition. What if the church in Corinth hadn't taken any action against that guy that was sleeping with his stepmother? I mean, I would just say it's really hard to fathom a Christian. But but, I, but, I, part, but part of the repentance I agree. is being confronted with it if you're not seeing the blind spot. But I mean, that's real basic. Yeah. You know, yeah. But I, I'm just I'm not willing to 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 say I can judge his heart and to know if he's in Christ or not. I understand exactly I what you're talking evidence, about, Chad. I would, I would say the, ev- the evidence does not give me confidence to be able to say. You need to be taking the Lord's Supper. There's some things I'm going to leave in the Lord's hands, right? Yeah. And but I mean, but the church has the keys, right? So there's there's at least there's some point where the church could say, if we have followed our Savior's commands, to go to him and say, hey, this is a sin, according to Scripture, what you're engaged in here, and there need, you know, and we're urging you and pleading with you to repent. And, and, yeah. And so... In this case, a very public sin, just like it is in 1 Corinthians 5. If he doesn't do that, I think the church has the ability to say, yes, we baptized you or we we accepted your your confession of faith. But at this point, we don't have the confidence that you could take the Lord's Supper uh, because we don't have confidence that your confession is true. I mean, the church has to be able to make that call or we could never even baptize anybody because we won't baptize them if we didn't think they were saved. Yeah. So I don't know that it's. I don't know. They filled out a card, though, right? <laughs> yeah, they filled a card. But I mean, that's. So, I mean, I think we've got. The, I think we have the authority. I don't think it's vested in you or me. Yeah. But I do think it would be vested in the church. In the church. And but I think all of, these are discussions that we need to start having again because we haven't talked about this for so yeah. long. Well, I remember, I remember when we had an issue. Doug, Doug and I we had an issue in the deacons meeting. And I remember being asked about one of the deacons actually said to me he said. What is it exactly that gets you kicked out of this church? And then that opened up the door to have a conversation about unrepentance. It's not it's not the sin, it's the refusal to repent of the sin. Yeah. No, that's great. But we don't but you're right, we don't we don't have a, a knowledge of this. Yeah, and and we're afraid of it. Oh for, yeah, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. I, I yeah. agree. That sounds like the next topic we're gonna yeah. so. so let All me right. uh, let me ask you a question. Go ahead. Anybody can Anybody can answer this, but once the church's reputation has been tarnished, um, how does a pastor come in to try to restore that reputation? What What is the most effective way? Well, I, I think it, it's reputations are things which um, are lost quickly and hard to get back. And that's true for me personally, and I think it's true for a church as well. And so I think you're talking about a year's process, years to do that. But I, I think that comes by just faithfully every uh, week by week, month by month in those years ahead, reestablishing itself as being in the right direction. And sometimes, you know, the community's not 
not unwise. And so if uh, a new pastor comes in and uh, the church seems to get right on track again, they'll assume that leadership is taking the church in the right direction, and that will help with, with part of that, Darren. But uh, it's not, none of it is immediate. None of it is immediate. In some cases, when, they, when we talk about replanting a church, if you go to a, these NAM replant conferences, they can, they'll say that the damage of the church can be, the reputation of the church can be damaged to a degree that it's easier simply to uh, close the doors of the church briefly and reopen it with a new name and a new branding so that you can leave that old stigma behind and, and be something new. And going along with what Nam said, like Mark Clifton, he says to love, stay, and pray. That's what changes the culture of a church. Yeah. And, and Ryan had good advice, I think, as just the patient preaching the word week after yeah. week is going to just be the, you know. I, I, find, I found that as I get older, now that I'm almost 50, and I'm really feeling it, uh, is that I really have come to appreciate almost 50 49 yeah. uh, so uh, some of us in this room are a little older yeah you're a little older so y'all really want y'all will really understand what I'm about to say uh, <laughs> but as I've gotten older I mean I'm always like I, I feel like you get a more well, let's just wait and see and what you come to appreciate I think as you get some years under your belt is just the value of a, of a leader who's steady and steadfast. He doesn't have to be flashy. Everybody wants a flashy, but I mean, the thing that people appreciate... That's why I wear these preacher shoes. Yeah, yeah. so I wear my Nikes. Uh, but just just someone who's just there and doing their thing over the course of a decade or two, I think that really, uh, that is just the most healthy thing. It's just someone who's just, who just... It can be counted on. Yeah. And I think if you kind of become that person, it heals the sheep and probably really does affect the, the stand, standing in the community. And what, and what put us into that place, Chad? It was the fact that our average pastoral tenure got down at one point to 18 months. National average of Southern Baptist pastors in churches. And is it going up now, right? I mean, it is. I think it's closer to three or four years. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so that, I mean, all of the young men that I see going in now are like... I, I, I'm going to stay. My calling is to stay and be at this church for a while, and and that's helping because that helps leadership in the church. It helps stability in the church. It helps trust in the church. And so I think you're exactly right. Daryl, can I can I say two words about my book? Yes. So we've t- we we talked repentance several times, uh, and that when I was doing my dissertation. The question that I, I wrestled with was, what does that actually mean and look like? And is it bigger than what we call people to? And the answer is yes, mm-hmm. that it's hugely important. It's it's what God has done to us that he turned to us in our sin, and it's what we do when we turn to him. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote that and, and published it as a book. Uh, first three chapters are, are pretty in-depth into the, the biblical uh, theology. Last three chapters are very, very practical, um, and so that's what that book's about. You can, it's on Amazon, uh, Kindle, hard copy, soft cover. There's some over there, so uh, you can find me. But yeah. yeah, that's what it's about. If you want to, just is there is there more to it? Yeah, there is. It's not 